Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon on another of our webinars. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about bridging the technical skills gap, thriving in the digital age of accountancy. Um, I'm your moderator for today. My name is Lucy Cohen. I'm one of the co-founders of Mazuma. We specialize in subscription-based accounting and we've been around since 2006. And I've got an esteemed panel with me who are going to offer their insights, opinions and experience on this, let's face it, huge topic. Um, we spend a lot of time as accountants talking about uh, how we are bridging that technical skills gap. Um, so I've got a great panel with me. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, so first up, we've got Harold Jacobs. Harold, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, thank you, Lucy. So hi, everybody on the call. Um, yes, yeah, so, as Lisa said, my name is Harold Jacobs. Uh, I actually work for QuickBooks. Um, I work in the account management team and I look after a range of our partners in uh, northern London and in the Midlands Territory. Wonderful. Um, and Johan, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, uh, my name is Johan Gori. I'm the Group Managing Director of the OnPoint Accounting Group. We've got a few different offices across the UK, and I'm also the co-founder for a practice management tool called uh, Client Engager. Thank you. And finally, we've got Chris. Chris, let us know who you are. Hi, I'm Chris Reeve, uh, Managing Director of Gascoigne's Accountants. Uh, we've got three offices across Suffolk and Norfolk, and I head up the team over there. Wonderful, thank you. So as you can see, a great panel today. So this is um, our QuickBooks webinar in, sponsor, in partnership with Accountancy Age, bridging the technical skills gap, thriving in the digital age of accountancy. And now we've introduced the panel, I'm just going to do some very brief housekeeping. Um, please do feel free to submit questions throughout the webinar. We will be answering these at the end. So uh, don't worry if we're not picking them up as we go along, I'll save them and I'll pick them up towards the end of that webinar. Um, you can submit your questions using the questions box that should be found at the bottom right hand side of your screen. If you've got any technical issues, please submit them using the same box and one of our tech team and a specialist will uh, get in touch with you and sort that. But hopefully so far so good. We've not had uh, any technical issues as we've been uh, doing that. So let's kick off then. We've got a lot to get through today. Big topic. Um, we're going to look at uh, you the the theme one which is understanding the skill gap i think it's fair to say and just offline before we started here johan you're giving a very good example of maybe a digital skill gap that uh you've experienced just today so it's something that we do um we do experience as accountants and we need to be cognizant of what skills do you believe are currently highest in demand for accounting firms and why do you think that there's a lack of these skills currently in the market um, i'm going to go to johan first on this <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we've got quite a lot of potential skill gaps coming up in the, in the near future. We've all been told over the last five, 10 years that the accountants and bookkeepers should be doing more advisory work. Traditionally, without stereotyping too much, I would argue accountants and bookkeepers haven't always been the most people centric pe people. They've not always had the best people skills. And we don't do anything about customer service or anything like that in our accounting qualifications if I go and do a health and beauty or woodwork course or anything like that those courses are more rounded they've got business skills they've got communication skills customer service sessions we don't do any of that we just look at our tax and our double entry and get told that's enough to be an accountant and a bookkeeper so people skills technology skills they're all going to be fundamental going forwards and keeping up with what the latest technology needs us to facilitate and how we need to work with that technology it's going to be really important great thank you and um, i suppose same question to chris really um what do you believe is you know, currently highest in demand here for accounting firms yeah i agree with johan it's um i think it's quite it's an interesting time i think in accounts at the moment where like johan said with everyone it's you know advisory has been the buzzword for a long while i think a lot of accounts are in the middle ground with it where we do a lot of advisory we, we don't necessarily see ourselves as that and then we've got the big advisors out there who sort of say they do that a lot but perhaps don't always do the the, the bottom sort of skills of accountancy and tax itself so i think there's a interesting mix in this and i think it's hard for the trainees and youngsters coming through where they've i think they're being told where accountancy is going so they've everything's on accounting software so it, it's harder than it than it was when I was I guess I was training growing up where a lot of things were manual and you you got a really good development from the ground up and then when 
accounting software came in, you knew exactly what you were doing, whereas now it's near enough you're expected to, to do it straight away. I will say that the trainees have got, I think that we have a excellent IT, far better than me. So that bit's a huge positive, but the I think the level of skills might be trickier from the from the um, when they start really. So do you think that's a, a case of um, some aspects of technology outpacing what's being taught uh, in you know, in the professional qualifications? And but also that we do so much in technology that there's a lack of understanding of those kind of core components um, of. Yeah, you know, I remember when I learned you know, back to drawing tier counts. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's maybe missing a little bit? And that's part of why we're getting this skills gap, because the, the theory doesn't match the digital. I think so. Yeah, I think that there's obviously a lot of AI. I mean, that's the huge buzzword at the moment. And the accounting software will give its own version of what it should be. And it's very easy just to tick and agree to that. And mm. you can obviously agree all of you can reconcile everything very easily because the because it enables that. But what you necessarily produce at the end might not be um, quite spot on. So yeah. got it, Chris, I'm going to I'm going to stay with you. Um, uh, on this question. So what are some of the, the negative implications that you've experienced um, your, your firm due to this kind of skills gap and training gap that the accountancy industry is experiencing? What are some of the negatives that you, you've, you've experienced personally? I think, I suppose it's that same point really. I think where if something comes through from a client and they've and they've allocated something in their bank was said what it is the AI in the accounting software will push um, the accountant doing the job towards that towards that item so you could near enough put anything as a client and the AI will pick it up near enough allocate it there for the person who's completing it and it's like oh great job done and but it doesn't necessarily mean it's mean it's correct and I think that's for me that's the, that's one of the biggest areas really it's sort of nearly doing the job for them but they, there's a lot more thinking that needs to go behind it I guess. Sure sure so a gap between the the theoretical and the digital is what we're kind yeah, of talking about so, yeah. yeah yeah Johan do you have anything similar or anything to add to that what have, what are the kind of ne negative things you you've experienced? Oh. I feel sorry for anyone that's studying accounting and bookkeeping at the moment. I mean, the fact that our training courses still refer to it as computerized bookkeeping, like it's this new fringe <laughs> thing that may or may not catch on. And it's like, yeah, yeah, like computerized bookkeeping. Really? Are we still calling it that at training level? Um, you know, I mean, I'll be honest. It's the best employees I've have in my team came to me with no bookkeeping and accounting knowledge. I can teach bookkeeping and accounting knowledge. I can't teach problem solving. I can't teach dynamic thinking. I can't teach interpersonal skills easily. I, I can teach bookkeeping and accounting to anyone that's willing to learn. So there's some, some of my best employees have come through the unqualified route. And I think that that's a, a testament to how unfit some of our qualification training is at the moment. Do you think we? Do you think as an industry then we've got a branding problem? I, mean, I think we've got a huge branding problem. I mm -hmm. so I think all of us on this call know that if we turn up to a Cantex next year, there might be one or two people in suits, and actually that's more of a gimmick. That's more of a, a peacocking, draw draw attention to them type thing, because we're all there in jeans and t-shirts. But in the public's eye, we're still the ones that walk around in a three-piece suit and a briefcase. And it's a completely male dominated industry when there's mm -hmm. nothing further from the truth. Just in the last five years, that's completely revolutionized. But I don't think that image is anywhere close to being transparent to the general public yet. I think they still look at us all and go, oh, accountants, that's like suits, isn't it? Where you're all in suits in a tower block, fighting each other for promotions and to become partners and fight for best client portfolios. Um, so we, yeah, we, we still need to work hard to get rid of that reputation, shall we say? Yeah, I'm just looking at amongst the the us on the webinar. I'm not a, not a suit amongst us. Um, we're we're very modern, but yeah, to your point there, it, 
we, we're saying we've got this this skills gap, but if we're not branding properly, that pipeline of new talent is going to be non-existent, right? Uh, yeah. How are we going to track the right people in? It's if we're looking at this from a marketing perspective, it's the marketing funnels all wrong. As an industry, we're we're clearly not getting it right. Um, I'm going to move over uh, to to you, Harold, because obviously as a tech provider, I'm really curious what you're doing to help narrow this skills gap. Yeah, so it's, so it's interesting actually. Following up on on the points from Johan and Chris, I think from QuickBooks perspective, the main focus is to narrow that gap between the theory and the digital world that we now live in and also work in. Um, so QuickBooks, there's a, a few different things that we're, we're trialing at the moment. So uh, firstly, we're trying to help train the next generation of accountants through our educators portal, which offers a, a wide range of resources and materials for them to, to learn and also keep for later use. Um, secondly, as well, we've also recently partnered with Pearson and with the ACCA, to offer free access to our accounting software for the schools and colleges. Um, the reason why we've done this is because hopefully this will allow them to offer our services to the students who are studying at T level uh, in accounting. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is because we're hoping that off the back of this, uh, students who are who are successful in completing their T level technical qualification in accounting uh, would get the QuickBooks Online Course Certification Award, and they can put this on their CV, and obviously that can help them get jobs moving forward. Uh, with accountancy practices that already partner with QuickBooks. Um, it's also worth noting that given a lot that a lot of students have access to free webinars, uh, they can also get training designed to give them skills for the future. Um, and we're kind of planning to work further with other key accounting partners to help find placements for some of these students. So, so as I've said there, there's, there's a few different things that we're currently trying to do to kind of bridge that gap. What was the catalyst then? So obviously, at some point, you recognised that there was this gap. Did that come from your work with accountants, like working closely with accountants? Were they were, were people like Johan and Chris feeding back to you? There's a gap. Are you looking at the wider industry? Have you recognised that pipeline between? Yeah, you know, you've covered there. You're you teaming up with training and training providers and accounting bodies. What was the catalyst to to make you take action to address this problem? Yes, I think it's all of the above, really, that, that you've just mentioned there. I think, firstly, obviously, listen, listening to customers and understanding what, aside from obviously kind of the, the accounting side of things, what's the main point for their business, main pain point, sorry, for their business in terms of trying to grow the business, trying to become more efficient, um, and this kind of skills gap, and I suppose kind of, I don't want to say labor shortage, but that mm -hmm. kind of challenge was one of the main feedback points that we got. So, Obviously, as a as a tech provider, and we want to be seen as a partner with with our customers. You know, we want to try and help them and facilitate them for growth. So, yeah, I think just listening to our partners, understanding what their pain points were, we identified that if we want to help our customers to continue to grow, we need to help them solve this this challenge that they have. Yeah, absolutely great. Um, so we're looking at skills gap generally, and I think as a profession or as an industry, there's. Um, you, uh, Johan, you, you've, you've talked about advisory. Um, you mentioned that earlier on. And there's this gap between compliance and advisory, people focusing on advisory. We've got a gap, Chris, you've mentioned between that kind of technical knowledge and the application of it within technology. I think um, I remember when I first started using the phrase computerized bookkeeping system made me chuckle because who even calls their PC a computer anymore or a laptop? I don't think anyone even uses the word computer now, do they really? Apart from old people. Um, but you know, it's, um, uh, sorry to any old people out there. Um, but yeah, you, you talk about your PC or your laptop or your desktop. You, 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 we tend not to say like, I'm going to go and do it on the computer. Um, so even just that language is, is really out of sync with what we expect people today to be doing and I remember when I first started using uh, online accounting software that um, it was the it used to frustrate me that um, it, people could you know, claim that they could be an accountant and didn't understand that kind of the, the trial balance the double entry behind it and therefore didn't make sense are we seeing that problem in this skills gap with new people coming in Johan you've said that you know, people who don't have accounting knowledge are really great trainees how do you address that skills gap in your in your firm um, and does it matter I I don't think it matters as much as it could do I mean mm -hmm. if I look at if someone has a problem and they've They've not. They need to work it out. There's so many ways we can teach people accounting skills now. We've got videos. We've got books. We've got textbooks. We've got podcasts. We've got webinars like this. We've got peer learning from each other. 
like there's so many options and actually most people don't respond well to learning in a classroom environment and i think the biggest gripe i have with the classroom environment is nine out of ten times our accounting courses are trained or taught through a textbook by someone that's learnt themselves through a textbook and has got no real world experience of being an accountant that's just what they teach is accounting and you just think well where's where's the problem solving where's the gray space the moment someone comes into a business into an accounting space from university with their degree and it's not black and white in a textbook anymore it's not what what do you mean it's not black and white what do you mean there's some gray space where we can interpret things how we how we see appropriate and they just go they break down whereas if you've learned it from the beginning that there's always there's always gray space mm. yes this customer might count count this as a cost of sale but this customer doesn't like they get the, the work the world around them whereas in in school and college we're taught this is how you categorize this transaction full stop yeah and it's like well yeah. actually that's not the real world yeah so it's actually the think... application of the skills in the real world that i i worry about the most yeah i think there's also that real world application isn't there of the way that yeah, the way that uh, we learn to be accountants is structured in such a way that there's a presumption that all of our clients speak accountant yes, and the they don't. Of it all. Yeah, you know, accountants, uh, clients you know, refer to what they what goes on within their own finances in the most weird and wonderful ways. And sometimes it's learning to translate that stuff, which I think is also a skill. But I want to dig in, Johan, um, really to ask a bit more about how how are accounting professionals supposed to assess their own skill gaps and identify areas where they need to enhance their technical expertise. Is this just ticking CPD boxes? Like, what's the gold standard here? How are they assessing their own gaps? But even our CPD is broken, ultimately, because we, when we ask, when our governing bodies ask us to deliver our CPD, what are they going to accept as CPD? Oh, I've been to tax sessions, I've been to Accountex, blah, blah, blah. But actually, they don't recognise that spent, someone spent four, eight hours this year learning about leadership and management. Mm -hmm. Now, if they want to progress in the career, they need to learn leadership and management. But we don't recognise that as CPD, in our CPD logs, we go to, have you kept up to the late date with the latest tax and payroll updates? Well, is that is that hugely relevant? So I think... Anyone that wants to go anywhere in, in any industry, they need to be self-aware and they need to be very honest with themselves about what their skills and strengths are. And they need to either say, well, actually, people skills isn't my strength. I've now got a choice. Do I work to improve that? Now, that could be talking to your line manager, talking to your friends. How do you do this? Or finding someone that you see as a role model in that skill set. Or it could be, a, you know what, it's just... It just grates against me it's not my thing i'm more technical but that's fine but that you have to accept that comes with certain restrictions on your career path so i think we a lot of accountants and bookkeepers aren't overly open and honest with themselves i mean no one in the world is overly um i think naturally good leaders and managers are very open and self-aware and if we had more people that were self-aware of their own and accepting of their weaknesses and strengths and how that works and how actually a weakness to one of one person can be a strength to the team, then I think the industry would be in a much stronger position. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I, I, I can't, can't do anything but agree with you, really, uh, Johan. Chris, um, yourself, how do you think accounting professionals should be identifying, assessing, and then dealing with their own, um, I was going to say shortcomings, not shortcomings, but areas for improvement, skill ga skills gaps? Um, it was a great piece from Johan. I'm not sure I can beat that, but I, I'll take it the next stage. I think I think that what we've identified in our firm was that everyone wants to become qualified. I suppose they know that the salary that that can bring um, and the expected career path, but it it also brings a lot of issues where you can qualify under say ACCA or ICAW and then what's next. And once you've qualified, can you do the role? Can you be a client manager? Can you be client facing? Have you got those skills? And I think we've seen certainly over the, probably the last five years that the ones we've come through is like, what's next? What can we what can we do next? And there are the leadership and management courses out there where um, we've, we've just started on over the last, I think it's about nine months and it seems to be going quite, 
pretty well, to be honest with you. And we're hoping that that will, I suppose, to use the term, bridge the gap between um, being a qualified accountant, I suppose, at the age of 23, 24, to having a lot more experience and understanding of what clients need and what the trainees they're going to have need when they manage them coming through. So we're, we're hoping the next three or four years of attending these leisure management courses that they'll they'll bring those skills that I guess I had to learn on the job although that that can also be useful because you learn as you go along as well so yeah okay yeah I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna extend this further really because we've talked about how um you uh the if you were learning hairdressing or massage or woodwork or whatever else uh, some of those kind of interpersonal or you know, customer service skills essentially would be kind of part of the course but it's not in a Accountancy, and then we've talked about the fact that you know, accountants are focusing on advisory, and yet at no point are we ever talked to we're taught to advise anybody. We're taught to pass exams and write long essays about audits, but we're not actually taught about how to dispense advice. So, Chris, I'm going to stay with you on this question. Really, as the demand for advisory increases, as we're getting digitization and the you, the stuff that was uh, we were heavily weighted towards, which kind of basic compliance is, you know, we're using technology to make that more efficient. And we're, so we're waiting now towards advisory. I'm wondering what skills you think that the profession needs to focus on to help drive this forward, because we're, cl we're clearly lacking at the moment. So specifically, what, sk what skills are, should be focused on? And then you know, how, how are you implementing that? You've mentioned the management courses, but what else are you putting in there to, to deliver that? Yeah, I think it's the. I think it's got to be the the ACCA, ICAW training that that bring in, a, you know, the new type of accountancy, the advisory the, um, skills in there. I think, you know, they they've always concentrated on on the technical, and I think you know the, the I suppose digital analyst, analytical skills of what the figures actually mean, how they can be um, applied in business, what that mean to the to the client and you know perhaps benchmarking across different businesses so that you can actually have that have that discussion with the client i mean clients love nothing more than to talk about their business to them to to their accountant but if you are just numbers focused and just profit and loss focused then you're not going to be able to just dis discuss the business set itself are you you're just going to just talk what the turnover and profit is so they i think within the training you've got to build in think Johan used like real world skills you've got to somehow build that in into the training so that the um, accountants have have that both foundation and knowledge and ability to be able to talk to the clients in that way that's the only way you can talk you know you've got to be able to talk about the business to give advisory to be able to give that added value if you can, yeah. you can only talk about the accounts then you're limited aren't you yeah, I've, I've sometimes also wondered um, about you know, you're in school, and you learn languages and you have to do your spoken exam as part of the language. Why on earth that isn't part of the education piece for accountants? But there we are. That's a whole other thing of moderating that. Johan, same question to you then, really. We're focusing on advisory as a profession. Everyone's obsessed with it. Um, how on earth are we going to deliver it when we've got such a gap between what we learn versus what we want to deliver and ultimately charge for? So there's a couple of things here. One is the term advisory sounds scary. Actually, mm -hmm. what is advisory? It, it's just advice. So I've my favorite and uh, story for this is whenever I pick up a new client that's like a coffee shop or something, I already know my two first bits of advice for that client. Turn your coffee machine off at night. That will save you some money on the electric bill because it doesn't keep reheating water all night. And uh, if you're producing quite a lot of coffee beans grind up, then go bag them up, let your clients, uh, customers have them for free, and they can go put them in the gardens to fertilize the garden. And then uh, you've cut down your food waste as well. So two top tips straight away. No school or college has ever taught me that. I just know that I've seen it in other clients doing it. And it's like, that's genius. It doesn't take money. It doesn't take effort. And it's got an instant impact. And so ultimately, we are at the heart of a business network. Whether you've got five clients or 500, you've got those amount of clients feeding you their stories, their experience, their knowledge. Because as we've said, like they like to talk to us. They want to have that conversation. They want to show off their business and what they're doing. 
well, if we if we're seeing all of that, then surely we can be sharing some of that. Now, yes, if someone's doing some R and D, you can't just go around sharing that to everybody. But simple things like, oh yeah, I've uh, I've noticed a five percent cut in my electric consumption since I turned off the coffee machine at night. It's like right, I need to tell my clients about that. Oh. I cut down my food waste by get, giving away my coffee grinds for people to fertilize their gardens with. It's like, great. I need to tell my clients about that. And we are that. I think we are very often at the middle of this. We are the heart of this network of businesses and we don't share any of our, any of the stories or any of the experiences that we're learning from. Yeah. Which is a real shame and, and a missed opportunity for those coming up in the profession to hear you have those stories uh we quite often say to our trainees 80 percent of being a great account is chatting to your clients learning their stories hearing about their life their, their quirks their foibles their challenges um you'll develop so much more quickly if your if your ears are open to it yeah it's great um harold coming into this from a, a technology point of view then what can technology do that's going to help accountants free up more time so they can focus on this advisory. And like Johan said, have these deep, meaningful conversations as part of the center of the business hub. Yeah, I think I, I think um, the way I would probably summarize it you know, very briefly, but I would say that letting the, te letting the technology do the work. Um, so a great example of this from our perspective would be the automation of repetitive tasks. So um, as you know, I'm sure many of the accountants on this call know that um, this slows down accountants um, and having that automation aspect allows them to move away from focusing solely on compliance based tasks to being able to focus on the actual growth of their customers business. Um, so, again, going back to QuickBooks as an example, um, you know, our online service can automate many banking data collection services and also common tasks such as payroll, uh, which can save accountants many hours and even days within a month. Um, and, and also as well, we've seen this ourselves, that providing a more advisory based service to customers will in the long term lead to a stronger relationship and also allow you to offer increased ROI to the customer. Um, and then I suppose kind of going back to the previous point that I mentioned regarding the training, um, the different types of training that we offer to accountants, it's not just about the software, it's about the industry in general and how you can provide that additional ROI to a customer. And this allows them to provide a, additional I suppose additional advice around analyzing data and allows customers to get the, the latest kind of market insights. Um, and this helps accountants analyze trends and support their clients um, with the insights that helps them grow their business and ultimately thrive. Great. I suppose the the follow on from that really that I'm curious in is let's say I'm you know I, I I'm running a firm yeah. and like a lot of firm owners, I'm busy in it. You know, I'm in the weeds, I'm you know fighting people sending in that things late and I'm just like I'm, I'm in the doldrums of it and I'm just I just want to get stuff done and I know in my head that if I can just kind of get above the canopy of the forest and see a little bit more clearly and have some time and space I'm going to be able to offer this advice and I also know that the technology exists but getting into that journey can be really hard what advice do you give to those firms that know they've got to do it, um, know that it's going to benefit them, but are really struggling to get themselves out of that day to day? Like you said, taking away days on payroll yeah. and automating all these tasks is going to save them time. But actually getting from there to there seems like an insurmountable chasm at the moment. What advice would you give to those firms to, to help them on that path? And I'm going to throw it out to Yoan and Chris as people who've probably done it after, afterwards. Yeah, so, so so I would say let us help you. Um, so from QuickBooks perspective, so obviously all of our um, accounting partners, that we all we all have uh, designated um, account managers. We have a service delivery team. We have a UK support team. We have many other resources in the business. So obviously I, it's kind of like a chicken and egg situation there, isn't it? You want to do this, but you can't find the time to do this. You know, let QuickBooks help you. Let us provide you with that additional service, that additional onboarding support, that additional training. You know. I understand sometimes it can be scary moving from one thing to another, but that's what that's what we want to do with our customers. We want to help them bridge that gap. So my advice would be to just, you know, try and leverage QuickBooks and the, the resources that we have available as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Johan, as someone who's done it, um, I'm hopefully you can recognize that conundrum that firms will be in. What advice would you give to them in uh, bridging this gap and, and getting themselves to the next stage? So, yeah, I, I've been there. I've been stuck in my business and not getting anything 
any way forwards, as it were, with the automation and stuff. And I'm going to caveat this by saying I don't have kids and I've got a very, very patient wife who is quite happy not to see me for a day on a weekend. But you, sometimes you just have to accept if you want to take those steps forward, like automating your payroll, when if you've not got time Monday, to Friday, nine till five to do it because you and your team are too busy, you might have to put some hours in in the evening or do a day on the weekend because that one that will sacrifice will f- start freeing all that time up for the rest of your you know, your firm's future. So if I need to spend three hours one evening or one day turning on and setting up all the automation for my payroll so that it frees me up for a day a week for the rest, for as long as I use it for, then I see that as a worthwhile investment with a good return on investment. And that now gives me a day a week to now spend more time on my business, not in my business. But it's getting, it's that first step. It's that catalyst and sometimes we have to accept we need to do that in the evenings or weekends, which, yes, it's not ideal for the work-life balance. But in the long run, that couple of hours is going to be some of the best return on investment you will ever have. Yeah, lo- longer term, it's better for the work-life balance than working in January yeah. and working you know, 90 hours a week in January or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, Chris, you, yourself, you know, again, you've you've been there. I'm sure it's, it's a situation you're familiar with. What advice would you give to firms looking to kind of get themselves that next level? I guess you've just got to re- you've got to spend the time, like Johan said. And I mean, I think I'm fairly similar. I do have a patient wife as well, and I do a lot of it out of out of work hours because during the day you you are busy doing everything that you need to do around the business. But um, it's putting that time in to research all the different products that are out there, and you have to. Ed- I think I spent a long while over a certain piece and eventually you have to take that leap of faith and and um, and go with your gut reaction of which one you think is going to be best and and have the time to, to, to deal with it as a new project really and um, sometimes you, you're not going to get it right every time but you have to you have to make a decision eventually and and go for one of the um, products and try and choose the best one out there they will be a little bit more expensive but i think if you try and cut corners and go with cheaper options it will really cost you in the long run so you just have to put that time in and and go for it and get the product you think will suit suit your firm the best um and, and integrate, commit to it. integrate it and get the get the team involved as well that's always a big one for me always involve the team um choose certain members of the team that you think will be most suited to um to the project you're doing and then involve everyone else to get them to buy into it so that's what i've always done Great. So what we've touched on there really is I think that there's a there's a danger sometimes is we is we see as as oh yeah, I'll talk about as business owners because we are running businesses. Um, we see our jobs as being nine to five and then we forget that there's all this other stuff that we should be learning. You know, when we were studying our qualifications, a lot of us had a job, but also studied in the evenings. And we saw that as professional development and we were happy to do it. And then there's this weird switch that happens that when you start working for yourself, that kind of, you know, you've got to do the CPD. And like you said, Johan earlier, it's um, what we class as CPD is, I think, questionable, depending on who's judging that. Um, but we forget about building a culture of learning. And we forget that having this culture of learning and continuous development is only going to benefit us. I'm curious, I'm going to go the other way around this time. I'm going to go to Harold first about how can firms use technology to attract, retain the top talent and and address the needs and expectations of modern job seekers? Um, Because that technology should, you buying into that and that culture of learning with technology should help you bridge this we've all talked about having this talent gap and this recruitment being hard at the moment how's technology going to help help with this problem yeah so I I think there's many ways that this can help with this problem so um I think initially offering technology training um to new to new staff is a good way to give them the opportunity to upskill and could be a good good sweetener in a deal if you're looking to attract new staff um in terms of kind of looking at this from kind of your existing staff Offering technology training um, ensures that they're up to date and they're still learning and improving their skill set. So, again, that's given the existing um, employees the chance to improve. Um, another point as well, I think you kind of briefly touched on it, and things has a special relevance today as well, especially after the pandemic, is that job seekers are looking for more flexibility and they're looking for jobs that offer a different type of hybrid environment. So again, looking at this from from QuickBooks perspective, uh, we look to make sure that all of the users have the ability to share data 
um, and necessary documents in real time from anywhere in the world. Um, and this helps kind of promote that remote and, and hybrid working environment um, and allows staff to access the software from anywhere at any time. Um, and ultimately, this will, this will boost engagement and also increase the job satisfaction. Um, and I suppose if you're looking at this from kind of the employer's perspective, this can help them become an employer of choice um, and also can give them a, a quite a considerable strategic advantage over um, kind of their competition who maybe are still using desktop based software or, or maybe no software at all, really still still kind of doing things through paper and pen or, or using Excel, basically. So, yeah, I think there's a, a few ways, basically, that that can answer your question. Great. We um, we recently took on a business that was still they were a business that had been running a hundred years and they were still using ledger books, which um, yeah. made me feel quite nostalgic about the whole thing. Uh, the old ledger books. I remember them from my mum's shoe shop back when I was a kid. Um, yeah, this this technology can definitely we're promoting this continuous learning environment, this culture of learning, and you know anybody who's ambitious recognizes that you your job doesn't stop at five o'clock and that it's it's the podcasts you consume it's the it's the articles you read it's the things you sign the newsletters that land in your inbox what you sign up to all of that is going to build um who you are as a professional whether you're an employee or you're running a firm how are leaders um going to create this culture though it's and i, and I find it's a fine balance because you, you don't want to sit there and go, oh, I'm putting in all these hours at the weekend and, and all the rest of it, because you might put people off and think that in order to progress, they have to work mad hours. Um, but how are you going to get that mindset into people and foster a mindset of kind of continuous learning, this culture of learning? Um, I'm going to come to you first, Johan. How do you think, what's the first of all, what's the responsibility? Is that our responsibility or should we be leaving it to people to kind of be self-starters? And if it is our responsibility, how on earth do we do it? I think we lead by example. As leaders and managers, we shouldn't be stopping learning. Now, what we're consuming might be different to what a team member's consuming. But so, for example, so we use um, Notion, Wikipedia type database type thing internally, where we've got loads of just resources and stuff. But on there, I've got my recommended podcast list for my team to see if there's anything of interest to them. I've also got a recommended load of audio books slash books that you can go and read that are on different topics, whether they're about leadership and management or developing processes or whatever it is. So we need to help guide them in the right direction. Um, and we, it's just sharing that experience. Like if someone says to you in a conversation, oh, I'd really like to get into that. Oh, well, actually, if you ever listen to this book or watch this guy's videos, I found they've been really helpful. So if we can just help nurture and guide them, ultimately, it's up to them if they're going to do it or not. Now, personally, I always do. I always have a podcast on when I'm cutting the lawn or walking the dog. That's my podcasting time or my audio book time. You know, I used to have to cycle into uh, work, and that was a five mile round uh, trip each way. So I got about forty minutes of audio book in each day, which was fantastic. And my rate of consumption is considerably lower now that I don't have to cycle into work. But I think if we can point them in the right direction, if they are inspired enough and motivated enough they'll take take up the resources we give them i think what's also important though is that we don't get frustrated that they don't take those resources up like we can point them in the right direction but if they're not motivated and they're not interested we can't get annoyed and frustrated just because they aren't willing to progress their career in the direction that perhaps we think they should um you know it's like a parent thinking they should their child should go to university and do a certain course ultimately it's the child's choice we can suggest things but we can't really force them to do anything um so yeah i think we need to provide the materials we need to provide the opportunities you know give them the opportunity to go to conferences and webinar events and stuff like that give them the opportunity to go and read and listen and study um you know i always say to my guys like if you want to if you want to take an hour or two out each week watching podcasts and videos and stuff that's relevant to work, that's fine by me. Um, you know, because I know I'm going to get better individuals out of it. Like, I've got a 22 year old. I asked him a few weeks ago, he's like, What are you up to over the weekend? I'm think, sat there thinking he's down the pub. No, no, he's been playing around with chat GPT and the AI and stuff. Well, I've now got a new head of technology. He's out testing yep. all the different solutions I, we're looking at for our firm. 
because it's a you know just two weeks before that conversation i said to him where, where do you want to focus and he was i don't know if i want to do bookkeeping accounts payroll i suppose i want to try them all that's actually no if technology is your passion then let's indulge on in that let's maximize the benefit of that for their enjoyment and our firm's benefit yeah, l love that. I think that you getting people to do what they're passionate about is key to get them to develop, isn't it? And for us, it's one of the questions we started adding into our recruitment funnel is when we start recruiting people, um, we want people who are always wanting to learn something, who have got little passion projects, who are, cu are curious. Curious is a word we use a lot. And yeah. one of the questions we always ask in recruitment was, what's the last book you've read? And it, tells you a lot about a person um it, it, i don't really mind if it's fiction non-fiction or whatever it's going to be but it tells you a lot about the sort of person they are and then and then you ask them do you read often like how how many books how many books are you reading and people who are voracious consumers of things tend to be very passionate about about what that thing is and you can use that if they're off at the weekend playing with chat gpt great bring it in um i love that it, chris same question to you really how are we how is, as leaders are we inspiring this culture and what difference is it going to make i think um i think for me you know all your employees are always different and you have to play to the um skill set that each one of them's got and like johan said if someone's got an interest in it then you know it's like a you know if someone's a volunteer then absolutely you know push them in that direction and, and make sure you involve them. And um, I think accountancy, you know, I started in the early 90s. So it was very much, you know, conferences, it would just be the partners, just the directors. And I think it's really great that accountancy changed so much. I mean, we've had the different software conferences and we mix it up now, it would be one director, one senior manager, trainee, and it would be the one who, you know, you've identified who's going to be very interested in that type of software. So to, I think to, to ensure that you use your employees to the best of their abilities. And um, I think one thing that's really tricky is I've always been someone who's all in. So I'm always working, always doing something. I, I can't, you know, I know, you know, life says it's nine to five nowadays and you should rest and everything like that. Well, I, I get very bored very quickly. So I, I can't just sit, do nothing. But I think historically you used to work a lot in the evenings and you used to bring your employees in into that. And I think you, certainly it's the sort of the narrative these days is you have to be very careful with that and a lot of people say you know all of your emails should be turned off so you have i think you have to be really careful as an employee that you don't employ you don't fall into that trap but also if the employee is really enthusiastic then if that's what they enjoy doing and want to do then then absolutely no issue so yeah i, th I think there's a big difference between creating a toxic work culture where you've got yeah. presenteeism as an expectation of people sitting yeah. at their desk versus having a culture where people feel like they're free to send you ideas messages in teams wherever it is at different hours of the day because they got excited i had one of my team took a week off and um, she sent me a message in Teams going, I know I should be off this week, but <laughs> I just woke up with absolute clarity on this thing. And I had to tell you, I was like, I love that. Great. Brilliant. But please do take a week off. Um, anyway, look, we're um, starting to get to the end of the kind of set section of this. I do have quite a few questions that have come in um, from the audience. So I'm going to I'm going to go through those if that's all right. Um, the first one's to you, Harold. Um, Harold, you talked about um, partnering up with the ACCA, offering training and free usage to students. Does this apply to ACCA, ACCA student members or full members who are currently working? And does this apply to England or only England only, or is it worldwide? And if so, which countries? That's a big yep. question. Yep. So yes, yeah, so, so I did actually see this question. I was trying to uh, get the full answer to this. So uh, in response to the second part of the question, uh, yes, this applies to the UK only. Um, in terms of the first part of the question, whether this is for um, ACCA student members or uh, members who are currently working, I would need to double check that part just to make sure I'm giving the correct answer. But um, to obviously whoever put that in the chat, obviously I'm happy to go offline and reach out to them directly to, to, to give that answer. But yeah, the second part of the question, UK only, for the first part of the question, I would need to just double check that. Great. Lovely. Thanks, Harold. OK, questions from the audience then. Um, I'm going to pose these to whoever feels like leaping in. So we've said there that those coming just out of uni or are recently qualified are not really ready for the workplace. How do you help them when they enter the workforce? We need new people, so surely we'll need to help them when they join the workforce. Um, Johan, I feel like you'd probably be quite passionate about this. Um, how do we help them? I, 
I also love the fact that every job advert you see for an accountant or bookkeeper says experience required. <laughs> Who's giving them that first experience if every job's saying that? Um, personally, I don't care about your qualifications. Someone can see me later, but I really just don't care that you've got a bit of paper that says you can study for a certain amount of hours. I'm more interested in your personality. I'm more interested in your skill set in the form of interpersonal skills because not just working with clients but also working part of a team what are you like for, how do you learn how do you work best what makes you tick that's more interesting to me as an employer um you know i wasn't recruiting for anyone someone turned up to my office one day and said look i know you've, i've not seen any adverts or anything this is my life story i used to be in accounting i stepped away because my wife had some really bad health scares I went out as an Amazon courier driver. It gave me the flexibility I needed. I'd really like to get back into accounting. Do you need anyone? Or would you consider me in the future? And if so, what would you need me to do training-wise? And I just liked that initiative. And he's been with me for four years now. Like, absolutely loved that. Just that initiative to go out and actually, what do I need to do to get back into the game that I quite enjoyed before life turned my world upside down? Um, ultimately, if you come to me with a CV with a degree on it, cool. but I can guarantee someone else will come to me with a CV with a degree on it and their QuickBooks qualifications, which they've done off their own back in their own time through the QuickBooks training and a list of podcasts they listen to or YouTube channels they follow. Like that is more interesting to me. Someone that's put in their time in their own time to go out and do something like the QuickBooks online certification, which they don't need to do, but it shows they've actually got a bit of get up and noused. They'll get that over, they'll get the job over someone that's potentially got a higher level degree than that other person. So um, what, what we're saying here then, if you're if you're coming out of uni, if you're listening to this, maybe you're coming out of uni or you have people around you who are coming out of university, because because I very much feel the same way um our uh, one of our staff has been with us for 14 years coming up and she got the job because she wrote to me personally she was working in a pub part-time putting herself through qualifications just wanted work experience and she reminded me so much of me at that age i just gave her a job because i was like great brilliant you can come in you've got the right attitude um we do have a generation of people that have been fed the narrative that you go to school, you go to university, then you do professional qualifications. And we've got people who are coming at, you know, out of these institutions and going, I need a job now. And I, I, we had somebody work for us when the phone rang for the first time, they just stared at it. And I was like, are you going to pick it up? Like, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I was like, well, hello is a really good start. Like, that's a really good start. But those basic skills, how do we help them get there? Like, what, what can we do as employers? Do we just tell them, like, go and practice or, or watch the videos? What, how are we going to help these people? It's really hard, isn't it? Because ultimately, I've got a degree in accountancy. Cool. So of the other 150 people that were in your course in that one university, now we take all the other universities that are probably bigger. Now we take all the online training. Who hasn't? Like, who's not got a degree nowadays? It's it's so much easier to get them because it's we've and rightly so we've opened university to a wider audience so anyone that has wants the opportunity to in theory can and that's brilliant but actually uh -huh. doing sorry siri's having it's a chat nice. sorry um siri's, siri's got an opinion about this siri's yeah. got an opinion on it <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately now everyone we've we've kind of taken that specialness that we've been taught growing up that is in a degree and kind of averaged it out we've watered it down a bit mm -hmm. um and yeah so that is where like you know if someone's worked while they're at university in a reception or in a customer service role fantastic because that's actually the skill set i'm looking for that experience you know i know there's a software provider I i've done work with in the past they won't recruit anyone that's not got a customer service role on their cv even if they're going into a developer's position that's got nothing to do with customer service. If you've not worked in customer service, your CV doesn't make it onto the pile because they know how important that view on life is. Yeah, interesting. Chris, how are we going to help these people? They've, you know, they've been told uni is the way they come out and, um, and, and we're all saying, we don't care about uni. Like, 
that's gutting. How do we help them get into the workplace? And how? And and you know, we 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 do have a, a shortage of of good new recruits. How do we accelerate these people into working for us? I guess I've got quite a good I've got quite a good working example actually because I've got one at the moment where we've you know the, this is about this. I mean, we have struggled to recruit um, trainees this year, um, and we've got someone um, one of the lads who works for us. His mate basically is at uni and he's kind of he's coming he's joining us september for a one year long um placement so i guess i'll tell you the answer in a year but um he's, he's doing an accountancy degree uh we've struggled a little bit to recruit so seem you know comes over as a nice lad same thing that um johan was saying personality was good so we thought well we'll we'll give it a go it's something we haven't done before um we will be throw him in in the deep end um he will have to answer the phone um he might not know how well it will ring on his desk so you know most people in this life are normal people so we'll see how he you know i mean when the answer to the clients if he doesn't come across well well he'll just have to improve next time so i'm always quite prepared to to see what happens and sadly you do learn by your failures most, most of the time that's the best way of learning isn't it by just constant improvement so i think as as employers i guess I can easily say it now because I'm doing it. You've got to look at those opportunities and and see if they're going to work for you. And and um, well, we'll see. I, I guess we'll see. But um, I think I'm very hopeful it'll work really well. I'm very hopeful that the person will then, I guess, want a career with us um, when they finish their course. So yeah, love that. Um, we've got another question that's come in from the audience. How do you currently work with people in your firm to identify their strengths and weaknesses? And what do you do after they've been identified? I think this is a really critical question because we talk about, you know, continuous professional development. We talk about 360 review cycles, all the buzzwords. But actually, if you're saying to somebody, you're not very good at this or you're great at this, but usually it's you're not very good at this. What on earth do you do next? And and what do you do after they've been identified? Um, I'll start I'll start with you on this one, Chris. Uh, someone doesn't know how to answer the phone. What do you do? Or, what's the process uh make them do it more i suppose yeah <laughs> but, um it is it's um i mean we have quarterly reviews of all our members of staff um and we do i guess you can I've been doing accountancy for a long while so you, you can identify what people can and can't do very very quickly i guess um let them know through the quarterly reviews sadly i think as you said as a i think as an english nation or british nation you know we Anytime we give feedback on things and you see reviews constantly on hotels, or whatever, they're, they're often criticisms. So it is you have to try and um, you know get it, get it right with what they can do as well and and things that they can't do. I think you just have to work on them and, and do them more. Really, I think this you know as a person yourself, the stuff that you don't like doing is stuff that probably you're not very good at. And so to improve, all you, all you can do is do it more, isn't it? Really. So. Yeah, eat, eat, eat the frog, isn't it? That's the uh... yeah. That's the thing. Uh, yeah. Johan, how, how do you handle it? You've identified someone's not great at something. Um, what do you do next? So we have a, we do have these quarterly reviews and stuff. I'm honest, I don't put much stock into it. Like I had one one new guy started a while ago with us and he came to this review. You could He was sweating. He looked a right mess. It's like, you're right. I'm just really nervous. I've not had a review before. I just said to him, look, if anything said in this conversation comes to you as a shock then I have failed you as a line manager because I should be communicating with you about your strengths and weaknesses daily. It should be in conversations. It should be in our general chat that we have. Nothing should turn up in this review as a surprise to you. Oh, and nothing did surprise him in that review. Like it's all great having this structure, but actually as line managers and leaders, we should be talking to our team, even over a coffee, like whilst, you know, crunching numbers, whatever we're doing, that's your chance to feedback. It doesn't have to be a feedback session or a, a mm. feedback of an observation, which I've documented for you. You know, like, HR is very good at regimenting all of this, but actually it should be constant. Like, it should be whether we're picking up for a Teams conversation on Teams or Slack, whatever we're using, it should be a continuous thing that we're always present and aware of. So whenever I, I, I identify any issues, normally you can identify, because you're constantly talking, you can always identify them a lot earlier than, they, than before they explode as a problem. But it's always like, oh, I'm not very good at this. It's like, you know what? Fred's really good at that. Vicky's really good at that. Jade's really good at that. Go sit with them. 
explain to them the bit you're struggling with because they've probably struggled with it themselves in the past, but they've overcome it and they'll tell you how they overcame it. And just use the team around you. You know, just because I'm in a better, I'm in a more senior position than, say, Vicky is, who's my head of accounts. I go to Vicky all the time with accounts questions and tax questions because I know she's better at it. It doesn't matter what her job title is and what my job title is and where I sit in the hierarchy and where she sits. Ultimately, she's the expert and I value that expertise. So, you know, I will go and sit with a bookkeeper and say, I don't, I can't quite work out how I need to do this. Can you help me out? And there's no shame in that. It's just recognizing who's got the talents and the skill set to support the rest of the team to not necessarily get as good as them, but it will certainly help them improve their own skill sets. Yeah, I love that. I, I, no one's asked this question, but I'm just curious now. Do you think that there's um, giving critical feedback, giving and receiving critical feedback is a, a skill in itself? Um, do you think that there is a, a difficulty in being able to deliver feedback in a way that's seen not as a, a criticism, but as a as a way to improve something? Chris is laughing, so I'm going to ask him to. <laughs> has he got an example? Um, because it's very you. Know, how how someone takes something is up to them. You know, they, they get to choose what what they, they do with the words you, you say to them. But you obviously want the message to land. How do we encourage people to see it not as me saying you're doing a bad job, but saying, look, you're great at this, not great at this. Let's work on this bit. I love the peer-to-peer -peer stuff because that's very much a level playing field. That's saying, well, you're great at this and you're great at this and you're not and you are. So let's all buddy up. But yeah, Chris, I saw you chuckling then. It's a concern to be really hard to make that kind of, you know, constructive feedback land um how do you handle that yeah i was, I was laughing because i probably can't use the term that i use but um there's a certain sandwich i always refer to so yeah we won't say this one online yeah, but i think so, everyone knows exactly what you're saying yeah you start with the positive don't you you, yeah. you put in there the negative and then finish on a good one so that they you know they're not i think you should never finish with the negative and mm. i think it's also just that being normal and understanding you know there's loads of things I struggle with, I can't do myself. And, you know, so it's that, I guess, level of empathy, you know, no one's brilliant at everything, are they? So you, mm -hmm. you just have to, you know, I thought Johan's point's very good. I'm not as good at putting it across, but yeah, we've got a team, you know, you go and see that person and don't be afraid to ask and, you know, and yeah, just be normal about it, I guess. <laughs> That's the main thing. Yeah. yeah, it's not a big deal. Everyone learned something at some point. None of us yeah. started off walking and talking. We yeah. all had to learn. Days of school day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so on that then, I suppose a lot of accountants start their firms. Or we're, we're running low on time, so we'll do this quickly. Start their firms and they become good technicians and then they move up, but they never learn to become management. At what point should accountants start le start looking at management courses? Johan's nodding vociferously there, so <laughs> Johan... So my background is actually leadership and management more than it is accounting and bookkeeping. I'm a chartered manager. Um, so I've got a degree in management and leadership and stuff. And it really, really irritates me that none of like we seem to think still in the accounting world that this is the most experienced tax person. He'll be a great manager for the tax team. Yeah. It's like, no, not at all. Like decades ago, we stopped promoting someone in the factory just because they'd been there the longest. We realized that wasn't right. You don't promote someone, wait for them to move on or die, and then replace them with the longest serving person in the business. That's not how we do it anymore. But in accounting, we still have that kind of clinging on there, like, well, so-and-so is the most qualified tax person. So, yeah, that doesn't mean they're great with people. If anything, they're probably not, because they've spent their life reading textbooks and dull tax litigation and stuff. So... We encourage in my business leadership and management training from pretty much day one. If that's the direction they want to go in, you do not have to be the best tax person to run my tax department. What import, what's important is that you're a fantastic leader and manager. You can manage the processes for your tax experts to follow. That will do me. Um, so, yeah, I think you need to... I, need, I think we need to start teaching it from the accounting qualifications upwards and bookkeeping qualifications upwards. So people have the opportunity to go into leadership and management roles when they want to. Um, it needs to be recognised as a part of CPD. Um, you know, like it needs to be so much more present than it ever has been in our industry. 
Absolutely. Um, just we're out of time. We're going to keep going. So much in this. Thank you so much uh, to everybody today for their inputs. It does bring us to the end of today's webinar. I hope that um, everyone got something out of this. I want to say thank you so much to all of our guests, to Harold, to Johan, to Chris, for their really valuable insights. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I will leave you all go about your days. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody.